Good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight with Katie Walderman. Our top story. The pandemic may have brought about their most challenging period, but manager Sue fears the worst is yet to come as she faces having to let go of her unvaccinated staff. Last May, we were clapping for our carers. Now we're sacking them. I don't feel personally I should be coerced and forced into having a vaccine. There'll be people watching this at home. They might have loved ones in a nursing home themselves and they'll be saying, why don't you just get the vaccine, if not only to protect yourself, but you know, to offer that extra protection for some of the most vulnerable people, the residents here. Yeah, I do have a duty of care. Also tonight, Karen resorted to making the toilets her home after being assaulted while sleeping in a doorway. I put my cardboard up down here and then I'd grab some tissue so that it kept that draft out. I could have a wash while I was in here, wash my underwear out in here before now and dried it under the hand dryer. Back then, in the situation I was in, that was like my safety place. I'm going in there today. I felt it was unnerving. It didn't feel safe. It didn't feel comfortable. It, didn't feel, it was horrible. And it's not just the increase in calls that's left them worried. So are the levels of self-harm. We are seeing a massive increase in children taking overdoses and wanting to end their life and this feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. While we're here, Sue takes a call about a young person who'd arrived in A&E. I'm going to the paediatric ward now. We've had a, a, an emergency referral for a young person that unfortunately tried to take their own life last night. Since we've been here today, the team has seen three young people that have arrived at A&E and they've asked three others to come in for an emergency assessment. All but one had made serious attempts of self-harm. Is that unusual? No, no. You were so little when Georgie passed away. What do you remember about her? I just remember all the good times. They were doing footprints with her and, and she sort of like shivered a bit because the paintbrush was tickling her. The new Alder Centre is based here in the grounds of the main hospital and will provide bereavement support and grief counselling to anyone affected by the loss of the child, no matter how recent or long ago the loss may be. For Jake, for Jimmy and Steve, it's more than a game, more than just football. I think it's the fact that they get it. And I know that's quite simple, but most people don't understand what it's like to lose a child. You get to pull on your baby's shirt and your baby's name, you get to play in their honour, and that's massive. That 90 minutes, whatever it is that I'm on the field, I play 120% for him because he'll never get to kick a ball. You know, <laughs> he'll... I'll never know what he looked like or anything. This month, the club turns one, and as part of Baby Loss Awareness Week, we join them for a special memorial match. They've teamed up with Sands United, another team brought together by bereavement. Because of what this week represents, I think it'll touch base with a lot of players. To have another team that are celebrating our, our children means everything to everybody on this pitch. Before kick-off, a minute's silence is held to remember all their lost little ones. Just being on the pitch with people that have gone through the same things as you, it makes you feel whole again and it gives you a purpose again. I consider that I am half Syrian, half Scouser. <laughs> this is our home now and we would like to feel that way, you know, that this is our home now. But unfortunately, most of the time, that's not the case. For example, in one workplace, I was asked um, if I have ever used a printer before. And I thought, what a strange question that is. Uh, of course I did, you know, uh, but I think, you know, that really kind of reveals what assumptions other people have. We're just humans like everybody else and we just want a life and you won't get to know that unless you meet someone, um, you actually meet someone from the community and you talk to them or become friends with them and get to know them because there's, there's a lot, a lot of positive things um, to do with, with refugees. Today's the first real taste of Arctic life for Prince Harry. He's flown in this morning, he's met up with the rest of his teammates and he's been briefed. But while the four wounded servicemen have had around 18 months to prepare for this trip, Prince Harry's got just a couple of days to bring himself up to speed before he sets off with the rest of the Walking with the Wounded expedition team on the trek to the North Pole and to the top of the world. Are you ready for it? Are you nervous? Um, I am nervous. I'm nervous for them. I'm slightly nervous for myself as well. I've got to say about five metres behind the man in front, that's in case if anything does go off, it won't be 
won't take both of us out and the same from the guy behind me. As you can see, I'm third in line and there's quite a few guys behind me. So the purpose of this mission <laughs> Some of the locals there come and say hello. The purpose of this mission is basically for the guys here to come out, meet the locals, reassure them, make sure they feel safe. I love it. I absolutely love it. Big time. It's one big happy family and it allows me to, to escape me escape from my depression and my mental health issues. You put some fire in your belly and no one's big, no one's better than each other. We're all the same. Every Wednesday the choir with no name meet here at the Blue Coat. Anyone can drop in and join in. We've all been through some hell and we've all come out on the other side. You know, we might dip back into that hell occasionally, but we'll uh, always have Wednesday nights to look forward to. We join them today on a very special milestone. They've made their 100,000th journey. So to put that into some kind of context, that's the equivalent of making one journey every hour on the hour for more than nine years, traveling 1.5 million miles. That's going to the moon and back three times over. And in doing so, they've saved the NHS more than 5.5 million pounds. A bit hard to ask what the weather will be like in a month's time. How about tomorrow, Katie? Well, I can tell you what it's been like today, Rod. <laughs> well done, that's, that's very good. <laughs> I mean, today has seen a little bit of something for everyone, hasn't it? So this week, it's going to be dry, it's going to be sunny and it's going to be warm, getting hotter. But how hot does it have to get to be officially considered a heat wave? Well, there's going to be places in the northwest that could meet that threshold. And in order to do that, you have to meet a certain set of criteria as set out by the Met Office. So here in the northwest, that is 25 degrees everywhere except Cheshire, where it's 26 degrees. And then it has to maintain that level for at least three days. And we can see here the reason for that, this area of high pressure that's continuing continuing to dominate the forecast right across the country, keeping things settled and it's having a big impact on the temperatures. We can see here Wednesday it's going to be mid to high 20s. Thursday, Friday, Saturday we could see 30, even 31 degrees and if you don't like the heat, luckily for you, things are going to get fresher next week. Thanks so much for watching. Bye for now.